In my last video, I mentioned that Japan has made some unusual pieces of entertainment. Yeah. Anyway, did you know that they've occasionally tried working with other countries to make these things? Take for example today's movie, Latitude Zero. Latitude Zero is a 1969 Japanese-US co-production made by several key people involved with the Godzilla series. The movie features both American and Japanese actors and was shot completely in English with the Japanese actors learning their lines phonetically. Can you tell? Has depth of mission been determined? Your wish is a command, my lord. Everything is near normal. You see? Ah, <sighs> The movie is also sometimes called Atragon 2, even though it has about as much to do with Atragon as Troll 2 does with fucking Atragon. Apparently it was intended by Toho to help establish them in America, which puts it in the same category as movies like Solar Crisis, Virus, and other Japanese attempts to enter the American market that nobody's ever heard of. I guess back then they didn't realize that if you really want to get Americans interested in your pop culture, the trick is to get hot girls to dress up like cartoon characters. Alright, so let's get introduced to our characters. We have plucky young 40-something boy photographer Perry Lawton, astronaut Fuji, and... Dr. Jules Masson, French geologist. French? From what I've seen so far, I wasn't even a minor medical problem. Oh, I see. Oh, right, of course, French. I was a little skeptical because we don't often see French actors here in Indonesia. Because that's totally where I'm from. Anyway, they're all busy reenacting the beginning of Warlords of Atlantis when all of a sudden an underwater volcano erupts. Hey! What's that coming at us? Oh shit, it's the musical score. Yeah, if I were them, I'd be concerned, too. Usually in a Japanese movie, this type of thing leads to a giant monster coming out of the ocean and fucking shit up. This time around, though, it just detaches their diving bell and throws them off course. Ow, my head! Ow, my feet! Ow, my head! Ow, my feet! They get thrown into an abyss, but are soon rescued by some divers. Oh, wait, did I say the abyss? I meant an episode of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Oh, come on, you can see the string. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, never mind. Wherever we are, sure as hell better than where we were. Yeah, don't get your hopes up. You're still in the same movie. They wake up on board a sub called the Alpha and find that their wounds have completely healed. Although, apparently someone stole the Power Rangers hoodies they were wearing earlier. Glad to see you two are feeling better. I'm Dr. Ann Barton. I say, a guy could get used to this movie. Almost makes up for having to see Richard Jekyll in a Speedo. By the way, would you have ever guessed that an actor from Citizen Kane is in this movie? Yep, that would be the sub's Captain McKenzie, played by veteran actor Joseph Cotton. You must be, uh, Dr. Teixeiro. Yes. Uh, that's quite the fabulous outfit Joe's got on there, if you catch my drift. Seriously, movie, I appreciate the effort, but the girl's cleavage is enough. I didn't need to see Joseph Cotton's, too. Well, this Dr. Barton's kind of young, isn't she? She doesn't look much like a doctor. Well, Mr. Lawton, uh, what's a doctor supposed to look like? Ooh. No, uh, I don't know. Suit of armor and a cape, four metal arms, British guy with a scarf. You know, a fucking doctor. This is the Alpha, a submersible. An American nuclear sub, huh? No, Mr. Lawton, neither are we Russian, Greek, British, or French, or any other nationality. We are neutral. I knew it. Swiss. Not only that, but apparently the sub is almost 200 years old. But the first successful submarine wasn't built until the 1880s. Not quite accurate, Doctor. A Dutchman named Van Trebel. I'm sorry, but there's no way I can take anything you say seriously in that outfit. Hell, half the time I keep expecting Charles Nelson Riley's voice to be coming out of him. <laughs> also, what the hell happened to Japanesey McNaught French? How urgent is his problem? Very urgent. The shock factor is manageable, but he suffered internal injuries requiring care we're not equipped to give. Oh yeah, I totally believe this chick's a doctor. And you recommend we call off the mission? If he's to live. I don't want to have to tell his family that he died. 
You know how emotional I get. It's around this point that we meet the movie's villain, Malik, played by the Joker himself, Cesar Romero. And you can tell he's evil because he practices his evil laugh in front of fish. <laughs> Malik lives on a secret island with his girl Lucretia, and if the decorum of their place is any indication, they also hold swinger parties on the weekends. Anyway, Malik wants to destroy Mackenzie because... Uh... Yes, we were students, not friends really. Uh, well, not enemies then either. He chose one path, I another. Yeah. You know how some people might decide to backpack around Europe after college instead of getting a job right away? Malik's like that except he kills people. Malik has a sub of his own, crewed by a bunch of people who look like they're late for their Flash Gordon audition, and he sends it to destroy the Alpha. Black Shark. My boat. The Black Shark has the Alpha in its sights, but they didn't count on Mackenzie's inventive piloting skills. They fire torpedoes at them, but Mackenzie moves up slightly. They then fire homing missiles, but Mackenzie moves down. They even try ramming it, but Mackenzie move sideways. Oh, how bloody inventive that Mackenzie is. Damn him and his ability to move in three dimensions. They manage to escape after entering a force field that for some reason has the ability to bend. Who does the Black Shark belong to? His captain is Perga, a woman. Hmm. Thinking of hooking up with the captain, are we? What? Just how old are you? Mr. Lawton, even in latitude zero, gentlemen do not discuss the age of a lady. All right, so I didn't actually say that. I just edited the footage that way. But look at that outfit. I couldn't help it. Okay. Okay, I'm a mature adult. I don't have to resort to just making tasteless gay jokes. Let's continue on. More skillful than most seamen. Just go to the next scene. At this point, we finally enter Latitude Zero, an underwater city that kind of looks like the prisoner village where some of the world's greatest scientists live together in a peaceful utopia. Plus, they also have chicks jumping on trampolines. Here, rather than serving the selfish interests of nations, everyone dedicates their lives to art and science for the benefit of all mankind and have technology far in advance of the surface. And they don't share it with the rest of the world, because even though they say they're working for the benefit of all mankind, they're really a bunch of selfish dicks. How is it going to benefit mankind if you keep everything down here? We frequently manage to uh, sneak new discoveries into the medical laboratories of the world. Yeah, we've got a cure for cancer, but we're going to hold on to that for now. I don't think it's too important. But, we have made a pill that allows people to get erections that we think is going to be very popular. What if he decides he'd rather go back to London? Oh, one of those will take him home. Hey, you can't fool me. I know what really happens to people who try to leave. Meanwhile, Malik kidnaps a guy called Dr. Okada, who kind of looks like an Asian version of Mr. Wilson from Dennis the Menace, in order to get a secret formula he's developed. He's developed a serum that can immunize against radiation. That's one sexy invention. Malik interrogates Dr. Okada, apparently by serving him Pepsi, but he refuses to crack. Do I get a reward for having brought them to you? Of course, little one. Uh, just what did you have in mind? To be alone with you. But before she can love Malik a long time... Alright, alright everybody just calm down! He tries to get Dr. Okada to give him the formula using some stronger methods of persuasion. Batman! Get it? Because Cesar Romero was on that show. Back at Latitude Zero, Mackenzie, having apparently just raided Barbarella's wardrobe, decides to mount a rescue operation for Dr. Okada. We must select three men to go with us on this rescue attempt. What's the matter with, uh, us? Well, you have no training and are completely unfamiliar with our technology, but okay. No need to rescue him just yet, though. First, they gotta hit the hot tub. That's how it's done. Alright, actually, it's a bath that makes them bulletproof for 24 hours. 
And apparently the only way to make sure it worked is to shoot them. <laughs> Just kidding. They also get some fancy gadgets too. Now these are dangerous and diverse weapons. The first emits a jet of fire. <laughs> oh man, these are too easy. Meanwhile, Malik decides he hasn't acted nearly mad scientist-y enough yet and decides to transfer the brain of the black shark captain into the body of... <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I gotta say this. Some of the miniatures and other effects are actually pretty good considering the time this was made, but the creature effects? Holy shit, do they ever suck. Look at this thing. It looks like something they wanted at Carnival and then decided to stuff a guy inside it. I've seen more convincing animals on The Muppet Show. Why the hell is he putting her brain in a lion anyway? A human brain and a savage beast. It'll be able to understand and obey my orders. Yeah, or it could get pissed off that you turned it into a freak of nature and try to kill you. Just saying. Seriously, putting the brain of somebody you just double-crossed into the body of a monster? Not the smartest idea ever. As if the brain transfer weren't enough, he also sews on the wings of a condor and decides to make a Japanese monster movie sized. This is my amplification serum. It will increase the size of this creature at least three times, all within a few minutes. Ah, come on, Malik. Don't you know the Japanese have a much easier way of making things bigger? One! Make my monster! Bro! Okay, so let's recap. We now have a woman's brain inside of a lion with glued-on condor wings that is now giant-sized. This movie is kinda weird. <coughs> Wait a minute, did that bat guy just cop a feel? He did, he totally did! Well, I guess that means that this movie has another American actor in it. Clearly the guy in that bat costume must be none other than Richard Boone. Only he would be bold enough to try something like that. The Alpha arrives at Malik's Island and they begin the rescue. Nipple, nipple, tweak, tweak, oh! We'll have to search. Could be in that tower. What, you mean the only building on the whole island? Yeah, that would be my guess too. They wander around the island for a while and encounter more guys in crappy costumes. You know, say what you want about the monsters in Godzilla movies, they may have been guys in suits, but at least with them you couldn't see the fucking zipper. Oh, and how about this part where they come to a lake of acidic grape juice? Maybe we can wade across. You have jetpacks! Why are you even bothering to walk around the island in the first place? Just fly to the damn tower! This is like if Superman heard somebody was in trouble and then decided to take a cab. Eventually they do make it to Malik's tower, which means it's goofy fight scene time. <laughs> Malik still has another trick up his sleeve though. Regular bats. Yeah, kind of underwhelming after the giant bat mutants, especially when it looks like they were drawn onto the film stock. So after fighting off Malik's Halloween decorations, they rescue Dr. Okada and make it back to the Alpha. Where's Jules? After my son. Okay, lady, try to show some emotion. I know you're in a movie with a mutant Build-A-Bear monster, but put a little effort into it. Speaking of which, for something the movie built up so much, the lion monster hasn't really done a whole lot. It just flies around and then waits on a rock. Maybe the filmmakers realized how it looked and tried to keep it off screen. The Alpha tries to get away, but Malik's not done with them yet and hits them with... A confetti bomb? Are all this guy's weapons party decorations? The Alpha then turns into a plane because, huh, hey, Japan. And lo and behold, the lion monster turns on Malik and tries to kill him. Wow, what a surprise. She came to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Scratch one island. Oh, and the island blows up too. Whatever, it's the end of a Japanese sci-fi movie. I'm not going to ask any questions. Back at Latitude Zero, Mackenzie... Oh, Jesus, what is he wearing now? He looks like if Paul Lind was a jockey. <sighs> Mackenzie prepares to take Perry back to the surface, but not before giving a final speech where he seems to be channeling his inner William Shatner. Mr. Lawton, none of us is wise enough to know when man will live in harmony. We do believe that eventually must. Until then, 
We must continue our work here because it's the only place on this planet where we can. In any contact with life and intelligence as fantastically advanced as this, but I must point out that the possibilities, the potential for knowledge and advancement is equally great. I don't even know how to describe the ending of this movie. At first it looks like it's pulling a Wizard of Oz with Perry getting rescued by a ship and seeing various characters from the movie as different people, including Malik, which makes it appear that the whole thing was a dream. But then we learn that Latitude Zero is apparently a real place. Longitude 176. 176. Latitude. Latitude. Zero. Zero. Eh, whatever. I'm just gonna pretend Perry was really Kaiser Suze the whole time and be done with it. So do I recommend this movie? Well, honestly, yeah, I kinda do. I mean, it's completely ridiculous, don't get me wrong, but at least it has the decency to be somewhat entertaining while it's being batshit crazy. There are a few slow parts, but overall the movie offers up the kind of silly fun that you'd expect from a Japanese sci-fi movie of the time. Please keep in mind that you do need to have a very high tolerance for cheese, though. Plus, where else are you going to see an actor from Citizen Kane wearing an outfit like this? Well, that's all for now. Till next time.